Hi, and thank you for joining us here at Living Life. May we be thankful for God's word so that we could not only hear his voice, but that we can apply his word into our lives daily. Uh, you know, when I first moved to Korea and after being there a few months and serving at the church, uh, they had just completed the building of the uh, construction of the new mission building uh, that they were dedicating uh, for training and sending out missionaries all over the world. And uh, everyone on staff, everyone who was a part of the church uh, came for the dedication and the opening of the building. And it was just uh, such a, a blessing to see all the pastors, uh, retired staff members, um, missionaries who are current and missionaries who are also retired, all assembling together to see the unveiling uh, of this new mission training facility. And it had uh, a chapel, it had uh, dorms, it had multiple classrooms, and it was just state of the art. And I just remember uh, just being so overwhelmed and just amazed that all this was put together and how much our church was investing so that our missionaries can be cared for and that they would also learn and be able to apply the things that they learn um, onto the field. And I kind of imagine that this is just a small scale compared to what the Israelites are about to see as they are uh, also completing the work of the temple and placing the ark into the presence of God inside the house. And this is such a, uh, an honor for them to be a part of. And we'll see all that being unveiled as we study this passage before us in 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings 8, 1 to 11. Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes, and the chiefs of the Israelites' families, to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the city of David. All the Israelites came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in the months of Athanim, the seventh month. When all of the elders of Israel had arrived, the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tent of meeting and all the sacred furnishings in it. The priests and Levites carried them up. And King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. The priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the Ark and overshadowed the Ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place, and they are still there today. There was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed it, it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. When the Prius withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Uh, the first thing that we're going to see here is the preparation uh, that went into preparing and, and making sure that the temple uh, was ready. And once that was completed, uh, now it was all about organizing and making, making sure that the word went out to all the people that they would attend this event. And I'm sure it wasn't easy trying to spread the word and, and getting everyone involved and making sure that all the important people and the elders uh, were there in the front seat so that they can witness uh, this historic event. 
Now, I kind of imagine this being kind of like uh, the opening ceremony of the Olympics, you know, that happens every four years. And if you ever watched it on television, uh, you know that uh, everyone's eyes, the entire world is watching and seeing all the people being represented, uh, walking around the track and the different countries and the people who are so proud to represent their country as they're walking around. And I picture that as this opening ceremony and all the people just honoring and praising and just so thankful that they can finally have this, this temple that took so long to complete and having that established uh, right before their eyes. And now what the main attraction of all this is the Ark of the Covenant. And after the completion of the temple, uh, now the Ark of the Covenant was making its way into inside the building and into the Holy of Holies. Uh, so it was now ready and it was complete. And once all that was happening, uh, I'm sure that this was part of the plan. And Solomon chose a date which was later after the completion of the temple, uh, probably so that uh, people can be prepared for it after the harvest. And it was also by having the later date, that was also the year of Jubilee. And I think he used all that to formulate in, into this ceremony. And now we see uh, the people who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant were the priests. And this is an important detail because uh, they were the only ones who were allowed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Solomon learned from the stake of his father David. You know, when the Ark of the Covenant didn't have its own temple, its own house. And uh, there was a time when uh, people, lay leaders, were transporting the Ark of the Covenant after they had just won the battle and who the enemy had stolen the Ark of the Covenant. And as they were bringing it back, uh, David didn't uh, follow the details by having the priests carrying it, but instead he had it on a cart. And as that was happening, it hit something and they thought it was going to fall. And a person reached out to touch it to prevent it from falling. And that man instantly died. And Solomon, who probably heard about this, uh, made sure that he followed all the details about the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but what really caught my attention in this passage was found in, in verse 5. It says that they sacrificed so much sheep and oxen that it could not be counted or numbered. And I think this shows the heart of the Israelites, uh, that they were so filled with praise and worship to God that the sacrifice that they were giving, it didn't matter, you know, because God had blessed them so much already that they had their own land, they had their own homes, and now this was a way to show uh, honor and glory to God uh, through this sacrifice and through this offering. And I hope and pray that we too can have that same approach, that when we look at our lives and we see how blessed we are, and when we look around and see that we have a church, we have a home, uh, we have uh, income, that all these things are provided for God. And so let us not stop giving worship and praise to our Father who has been so good to us as His children. And now, uh, once all that has happened, we see the placement of the ark. And in, in verse 6, uh, we see that the ark is placed into the Holy of Holies. And the reason why this is important is because the ark of the covenant symbolized God's presence. And this shows them that God is with them, that God's presence will be with the Israelites as they've settled upon this land. And it's interesting here that, you know, in the history of the ark, uh, usually there were three items, uh, that there was uh, the staff of Aaron and also a golden uh, bowl filled with the manna. But those are not mentioned here, but only the tablets are, are mentioned inside the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but then in verse 9, it says that the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel. And this is significant because it's a reminder to the Israelites of their deliverance out of Egypt, that they were once slaves, uh, but now they were free. Uh, even though this took place 
500 years ago, uh, they still remember. They are also, uh, just like it happened yesterday, that the presence of God is with them. And it shows here, it, it's, it describes God's presence like a cloud. And just like that cloud that was with the Israelites out in the desert, cloud by day, the same presence of God is being felt uh, right here in the temple uh, through the Ark of the Covenant. One of the things that we should be thankful for is that um, though we don't have the physical temple like the Israelites have, that we no longer have to offer animals as sacrifice, um, but now we are the ones that are the temple of God uh, because of what Jesus had done for us, that through his death on the cross, that we now have access to the most holy of holy gods, um, that who is righteous and is our father and that we are his children. So let us remember that his presence lives inside of us. And once we understand that, I hope that it will make a difference in your approach, your, a difference in how you worship, a difference in how you treat other people. Because this is why Jesus came and died for us. Uh, I hope that this will give you uh, a reason to worship, a reason to praise, a reason to really celebrate uh, what God has been doing in your lives. So let us not forget that we are the living, breathing temple of God. And just like the Israelites who continued to sacrifice and they didn't even, they couldn't even count how much sheep and oxen that was sacrificed to the Lord. Uh, may our lives be of, of constant sacrifice to God because of what He sacrificed for us. Uh, so let's give thanks by offering up to Him this prayer. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much uh, for sending us your Son. We thank you, Lord, that as we see in this picture of a temple, uh, I pray, God, that this is a reminder of how you saved us, uh, that we were once lost, but now that we are found, that you have established your presence in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, may we be eternally grateful, and may that result in worship and praise to you, Almighty God. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.